Book Five, Salem, Safety Assured, Leaving East of Mattacity. Chapter Four. We have no chance, do we? Jothan and Perrin slid back down the bank to the shins, waiting on the trail. Some movement, Perrin whispered. On the road, still far away, but the soldiers were running. The towers aren't lit yet. Soldiers don't normally run unless there's a reason, Jothan said, watching Jaitsey for her response to their update. But Deck answered with, Do you force all expecting women to walk until they collapse? It was the most rancor Mari had ever heard from her son-in-law. No, Jothan said apologetically. We usually give them a comfortable ride in the back of a hay wagon to about this point, where we disgorge our secret load out of sight. Most women need to walk only a few hundred paces to the forest from here. We can't exactly drive a hay wagon all the way to the edge of the forest, nor could we run a hay wagon in the middle of the night from your house. Hay's not as comfortable as it may seem, Jatesy murmured. Pokes your skin. Deck and I once went to the hayloft to try... Deck's frantic throat clearing stopped her. Mari looked away to smirk at her husband, whose eyebrows had gone up. It's comfortable the way we make it, Jothan told Jaitsey, generously ignoring Jaitsey's earlier suggestion. While on the outside it looks like an overstuffed wagon of hay, it's mostly an enclosed crate with pillows and blankets and even a trap door so women can relieve themselves along the way. Pato smiled at that. There's access to the crate below the driver's seat so children can go back and nap with their mothers and messages and food can be passed. On the driver's seat is one of our scouts, and posing as a sister or mother, depending on her age, is a midwife. The wagon's quite roomy and comfortable. I've seen that wagon, Perrin said. Never knew where it was going or why it turned around here. I just thought it was lost. So it worked as we planned, said Jothan. Well, there's no wagon for me right now, Jatesy looked up at them. We need to get to the trees then, don't we? I can guarantee your safety there. Let's go, she grunted, struggling to her feet. My legs will catch up later, and no, Deck, I don't need to be carried. Mari patted her arm and let Deck follow her, behind Pato and Jothan. Jatesy soon began to waddle slower, but when Jothan offered to let her stop again, she shook her head. The tree line loomed closer, the slope shifting as it rose up to meet the edge of the forest. Mari realized the path was putting them in view of the farmlands and even the patrols who normally rode along the edge. Jothan stopped before the disappearing path came level with the farmlands and crouched to huddle the family around him. This is the only tricky part. We have to run about 30 paces to reach the trees. Deckett, you and I will be on either side of Jaitsey, and when I whisper now, we'll rush her into the forest. Jaitsey, don't worry about keeping up. We can drag you at a good pace. Perrin, help Mari. Pato, stay near them. Should something happen, you catch up to me and let me know. Mari squeezed Perrin's hand, and he squeezed it back a bit too tightly. Jaitsey, are you ready? Jothan whispered. I'm not getting any skinnier. Jothan took her left side while Deckett took her right, and then everyone watched the west and held their collective breath. There was nothing to see or hear. Finally, Jothan whispered, Now! He and Deck stood up and sprinted awkwardly to the forest, dragging Jatesy between them like an overstuffed scarecrow. Mari almost forgot to run herself until Perrin yanked her along, Pater running by his side. Soon they dove into the woods, and for a moment, Mari marveled how upside down her life had become. Fifteen years ago, she ran into here terrified. Now she ran into there relieved. They found Deck and Jothan helping Jatesy sit down behind a massive boulder about forty paces in. Put your feet up, Jothan was instructing her. On the rock, you need to get your feet above the height of your heart. What's wrong? Mari asked, coming over. I can't feel my legs, Jatesy whispered. Mari touched her ankle that was no longer there. Yes, you're swelling up. What does that mean? Pato sounded genuinely concerned. 
It's usually not too serious, Mari told him, hoping that was true. But the best thing is to rest with her feet up. Jatesy pulled her leg away. Well, that's not possible, is it? She slid off the boulder and struggled to stand up like an ant heaving an unwilling watermelon. We're going to make it over that mountain and whatever else we need to do. Jothan, what's next? Jothan? There was no answer. There was no Jothan. Perrin shot Mari a look which chilled her. She put her finger to her lips and gently pushed Jatesy behind the rock and crouched next to it. Deck shielded Jatesy on the other side, but from what, they didn't know. I knew it, Peta whispered furiously as he stepped behind a tree. Before Mari could panic or even wonder what Peta thought he knew, she heard faintly in the distance the snort of a horse. Perrin slipped behind a shrub, and Mari's heart thumped madly. Mother, Jatesy whispered urgently. Deck, what's wrong? Deck whispered back, panicked. Jatesy gasped, squirmed, and gasped again. When I crouched behind this boulder, I felt, oh, ow! Mari's mind sent up a frantic prayer. What's happening? I need to relieve myself again, Jatesy whimpered. This is unbearable. What should I do? I'm, I'm going to wet myself. Deck's head quietly thudded the boulder in relief, and Mari sent up a follow-up, never mind, prayer. I honestly don't know, Jatesy, of all things, you sound like a six-year-old. I can't help it. Oh, this was a bad idea. I knew I should have waited to go to Salem later. Shh, whispered Deck. No more of that talk. Just do your thing right here. What? I'm in breaches, and that's disgusting. No, it's not. I do it all the time in the field. Out in the open? No one cares. You think you're going to find a forest washing room nearby? Hush, you two, Mari hissed. Jatesy, just hold it for a minute. A minute? I'll be drenched in a minute. Perrin, who'd been frantically waving at them to be quiet, stood up cautiously and started to creep toward the forest's edge. Mari wished Peto was closer. He kept moving behind the tree at different angles, and because he probably knew which spot was actually constituted behind, he was backing around the tree in a slow, perpetual circle. A few minutes later, Perrin bounded back to them, with Jothan. Perrin ran past Peto and pulled his dizzy son behind the rock where the others hid. Horses, Perrin whispered, at least two, moving parallel to us. There's a lot of activity in the distance. Jothan thinks we may have been found out. So what's the plan? Deck asked. Jothan's going to try to... But muffled hoofbeats coming from the opposite direction stopped him, and Mari froze in terror. Jothan appeared by Perrin. Up now, move, he whispered. Mari and Deck hoisted Jatesy up by her arms, but found themselves face to face with a large black draft horse. As the beast snuffed into Mari's hair, she decided she needed a forest washroom as well. She wondered if Jatesy still had a problem. A second black horse appeared just as suddenly, trapping Pato against the boulder next to him. I knew it, he whispered. Jatesy whimpered as two figures quickly slid off their mounts and rushed toward her with a large, thick fishing net. No, Mari exclaimed. You can't. Jothan's hand quickly covered her mouth. Stay quiet, he whispered. This is our help. Mari couldn't have spoken if she wanted to, because there were suddenly bodies, dozens of them, pouring out of the forest above them like a rockfall. Wild-eyed, she glanced over to Perrin, who had taken a defensive stance and looked vulnerable without sharpened steel in his hands. Pato cowered behind him, mumbling, This is it! This is it! That was because the men who surrounded them weren't dressed in model clothing like Jothan. They were dressed in all black. They were dressed as garters. Jothan, said Perrin, his voice tinged with panic. This is our help, Jothan repeated, patting Mari comfortingly on the back. That's right, a young man near Perrin said, oddly cheerful. We're here to kill you. What? 
Pato gasped. I knew it. Father, you have to listen to me now. But he stopped, because even in the dark, everyone could see that Perrin was breaking into a grin. Jaitsey, however, squirmed in a painful dance against her bladder, while Deckett kept a firm hold on her. Jothan sighed at their killer. Woodson, we appreciate your enthusiasm, but if you forget your training on your first mission, it's not going to look good on my report. Woodson shrugged apologetically. Wait a minute, Pato said, peering closer at Woodson in the darkness. You're wearing my clothes. Yep, I'm playing you tonight. Mari noticed that he was roughly the same age as her son, and her belly twisted in worry. He was young, far too young. Perrin grinned wider. I believe I know what's about to happen. The garters are making a return. Am I right, Jothan? Spoken like a man of the forest as we've always known you were. Then Mari understood. Just like Guide Pax, everyone thought he was dead, so no one bothered to look for him. The men with him killed a deer, put the blood on their hands, and told King Quirrell they had killed Pax. Very good, Mrs. Shin, said a tall man next to her. We took down an old doe not too long ago. When we're finished with your clothes, and Mari realized that he was wearing Perrin's shirt and trousers, we'll splash the doe's blood on them and tear them up. The story will be that Colonel Shin didn't kill all the garters in Moreland, although, rest assured, we're quite sure he did, but that a few dozen remained. We are those garters tonight. Once you're safely to the boulders, we'll make a bit of commotion at the edge of the forest and throw out your bloodied clothing. This is the garters' revenge, you see, the death of the Shins and Briders. Normally, we just slip people away, Jothan explained. But the entire world would be looking for Perrin Shin and his family if they went missing. But if it's obvious that the Shins and Briders were killed, then that's the end, and the forests are secure once again. I am sorry, he said in a gentler tone. While it will come as quite a shock to the world, we couldn't think of any other alternatives besides killing you all. Jaitsey whimpered, but not because of the news. And why are two dozen men keeping this poor thing trapped here? The voice came next to Jaitsey and was surprisingly female. Come here, Mrs. Brighter, out of sight of these men who should know better about expecting women's needs. Sorry, Barb, several men whispered. And Mrs. Brighter, a few more added. Barb's our midwife for the evening, Jothan explained to Mari, staring after her daughter who disappeared behind a more secluded boulder and a woman with a small bladder herself. Jaitsey's in the best possible hands now. Deckett sighed in relief. Oh, now maybe I can find a tree to water. Another man in green model clothing appeared next to Jothan. Mari blinked, wondering where he came from. What are all of you doing here, chatting up a storm, he chided. You all get to meet the shins later. Right now, we've got a problem. Perrin stared hard at the man. He turned to Perrin. Sir, the entire fort is on alert. You three? The man pointed at Woodson, the man dressed in Perrin's clothes, and Mari caught only a passing glimpse of him, the unfortunate soul traipsing around in her blue linen dress. Plan D, move it. The three of them took off without another word, with half a dozen men in black in pursuit. The garters were chasing the shins. Mari didn't know whether to laugh at them or pray for them. The man in mottled green had already turned back to Perrin. And sir, some of your former soldiers look as if they're about to enter the forests. Obviously, they know you're gone and they're desperate. Thorns hovering near the trees with ten men. Perrin gaped. He's going in? Someone let out a low whistle. Contingency two, all ready, Jothan announced to the remaining men in black, now anxious to get moving. Find the other groups and tell them if they haven't figured it out yet. Don't worry, Perrin, Jothan told them as the men around them disappeared as quickly as fog on a hot day. But Perrin caught hold of the man in mottled green. We knew this might happen, Jothan assured him. We didn't think it would happen so early in the night, though. 
Perrin was still studying the man in green, whose bicep he gripped. Do I know you? In a way, the man said softly. Your voice, Perrin pointed at him. I know I've heard that voice before, but it feels like it was a long time ago. It wasn't my voice, but my father's, the man said. I've been told I sound just like him, and look like him too. Oh, no. Perrin released his arm and took a step back. Mari turned to the man, who didn't seem familiar at all. Look, the man said, it'll take a lot longer than we have to explain everything. We have to get you moved and killed. We'll talk later. But I am glad you're finally in the forest with us where you've always belonged. And know this, all is forgiven. He slapped Perrin on the back, and then he was gone. Perrin rubbed his forehead. All is forgiven? Mari frowned. Who was that? Deck asked, returning from his tree watering. I, I can't believe it, Perrin said. I... Jaitsi and the midwife's return halted Perrin's stammering. Are you all right? Deck asked his wife. Yes, much better, Jaitsi whispered, her tone now as light as her bladder. But before the mystery of the green man could be explained, Jothan nudged Perrin. Two riders down by the tree line. Perrin squinted into the darkness. How can you see that far? Years of practice. I'll show you how we distract soldiers. Be right back. I want to see this, Perrin whispered to his family and headed after Jothan. Well, how do you like that, Barb said as Perrin trotted after Jothan. Left us already. Going to be one of those nights. Everything's going to happen quickly, and so should we. She slapped Deck on the back. Time to work. Husband and grandmother. Mari, stunned that every minute brought a new turn of events, looked around before she realized she was grandmother. Right over here, Barb commanded in a whisper. It wasn't until then that Mari realized another large man in black was by one of the horses, turning the massive beast around. Barb took Deck's arm and led him to a pack of the front horse. She handed him several long wooden staffs, which were strapped to the saddle, and showed him how to connect them into a long pole. You, the midwife pointed at Pedro. The uncle, I assume, hold the lead horse in place until we finish. Pedro, surprised by the label of uncle, obediently went to hold the bridle of the horse in front. The man in black ruffled Pedro's hair as if he were seven years old before he jogged over to the second horse. The midwife took the net of ropes and unfolded it to reveal that it was large enough to hold a person. She looped one narrow end onto the pole, and Deck fastened the pole to a ring on the lead horse's saddle. Grandmother, run the other half of the net litter through the end of the pole. Barb held it up for Mari. Our mother will sit in it. Jaitsi giggled quietly. She called you grandmother. And you our mother. Mari was shaking as she tried to work, but because of what, she wasn't sure. That the soldiers were looking for them? The sudden arrival of the men and horses, or the word grandmother. Call me Mari, please, she said, but that didn't make her feel calmer yet. The midwife took up the other end of the pole and attached it to a ring on the rear horse, suspending the net litter between them while Mari fumbled to open it. The bulky man in black stepped over to Jaitsi and whispered, Really, the litter's quite comfortable. Unless you want my mount, I'm sure you'd enjoy some jostling right now. Shem! Jaitsi cried in a whisper. She caught his arm and kissed his cheek as he and Deck helped her to sit in the net. Pedro and Mari spun around to see the man they hadn't recognized before. He was wearing a dull black jacket. Pedro rested his head against the horse and sighed. Deck patted Shem on the back. We've missed you! Likewise! Shem adjusted the netting on the long pole. Sham, am I happy to see you, Mari said, giving him a big hug from behind so as to not to impede his adjustments. Shem chuckled softly at the awkward embrace. Mari, I have something to say to you, he said as he tightened a few straps. 
Years ago in the forest, not too far away from this very spot, a woman said to you, Some day will come for you. There will be a day when you will be ready to leave it all behind and embrace the truth. Shem turned around to face her, and she could just make out that his expression was a mixture of amusement and sorrow. I plan for years to be the one to repeat to you Mrs. Young's speech. I'm so sorry I missed it. So often I wanted to... She put a finger on his lips. It's all right, Shem. The point is that we're here now. At least I can now tell you that I'm the one who set Barker on you that night. I wanted you to have a guard on your way home. Pato scowled at Shem talking to his mother. And Shem noticed. But we'll talk all about this later. This really is quite comfortable, Jatesy whispered from her net as she gently swayed cradled between the two black horses. Perrin emerged from the darkness. Never realized how a carefully thrown rock at the canal can unnerve soldiers. Shem, is that really you? Something's gone wrong. I left with ten soldiers to check on movements to the west, but Thorne was very paranoid today. He hasn't been able to find something, Shem emphasized. While I was out, Kieran, Barb's usual riding companion, signaled me from the fresh spring. I sent the soldiers ahead and stayed behind. Kieran told me Thorne had just sent out soldiers everywhere. He's probably emptied the fort. The sedation must have worn off early, or someone went by the house and noticed the guards unconscious. Perrin, they know you're missing. Mari saw the bleak expressions on Deck and Pato's faces, and that Jaitsi was nervously biting her lip. If no one else will say what we're all thinking, she said, then I will. We have no chance, do we? Mari, we have every chance, Shem declared, trying too hard to sound confident. No one's ever followed us through this forest successfully, and tonight will be no different. Kieran has already diverted my soldiers into a marsh. The horses will sink up to their withers this time of year. Which still leaves over 100 soldiers, Perrin mumbled. And we have nearly 200, Perrin, scattered throughout the forest and running into edge. Tonight's going to be messy. Killing someone always is, Shem smiled wryly. But we can handle messy. Jothan joined them. The decoys are heading into Edge. That will send the majority of the soldiers searching the village. Our garters will lead them on a wild turkey chase, and our men in the forest will confuse any who try to sneak in. Don't worry, we'll divert them all. Still, Perrin rubbed his forehead. I'd be lying if I didn't say I'm not entirely sure that your so-called garters can handle the soldiers. Except for... He added, as if he just remembered, that man in green. Why did I recognize his voice? Shem smiled slightly. Who did he sound like? Oh, but it doesn't make any sense, Perrin said. Why, he's been gone for... He may be gone, Shem said enigmatically, but not his son. Perrin exhaled. <sighs> he sounded like King Oren. Mari rounded on him. Oren's dead. I know, said Perrin dully. It was my father who ordered his execution, remember? I do, Pato mumbled. Oh, Dex said. If that was Oren's son and your father killed his father, that's a little awkward. And there it is, Pato said darkly. Shem put his hands on his hips and stared at Pato, who glared back. Shem opened his mouth to say something, thought better of it, then turned to Perrin instead. Yes, that was Dorman, son of Orin. The Youngs brought him to Salem years ago. Dorman's become one of our best scouts and quite a convincing face and voice for those who still struggle to accept our truths. Everyone knows King Orin's sons died years ago. Amazing, Perrin twisted to see where the king's last son had disappeared. Perrin, 
if we can get Dorman out, and that was another very messy night, we can get all of you out as well. But my grandfather killed his father, Pato exclaimed. Father, listen to me. He grabbed Perrin's arm. Think about this clearly. How can we be sure Dorman's not waiting to take his revenge on us? Mari's mouth dropped open at the suggestion, but seeing the earnestness of her son, she had to consider that maybe he had a point. But Barb simply scoffed at that. Ugh. Dorman was convinced of the uselessness of the kings long before he met the youngs, she said, as she adjusted her riding gloves. And if he wanted to kill you, he would have done it years ago. Besides, didn't you hear what his last words were? All is forgiven, Mari sighed. How remarkable. That he is, Barb said, mounting her horse. And as he also said, we need to get moving. Shem, we're all ready. Perrin gently pried Pato's hand loose. It will be all right, son. Pato whispered back, because these strangers say so. How do you know this isn't a trap? Mari overheard, and her eyes met Perrin's. I don't, Perrin whispered, but this is one of those times I guess I just have to have faith. In who? Pato hissed. Not necessarily in these people, Pato, Perrin whispered, but in the creator who told me to follow them. Pleadingly, Pato turned to Mari. She nodded her agreement and Pato threw his hands up in the air in aggravation. Something was up with their son, that was clear. But what that was, she had no idea. Looking for suggestions, she turned to Shem, but he was with Deck and Jaitsey. These horses have brought up many women over the years with no losses, he told them as Deck eyed the netting and Jaitsey squeezed his hand. They know how precious their load is. Deck nodded, but he rubbed his eyes as he crouched beside his wife to share a few last words. Shem turned to Jothan. You'll need to take Kieran's place with Barb. We'll all meet you at the first resting station. Shem, what do you mean? I think I've just given my resignation too. I was hoping that by abandoning my horse it would look like I had been taken or got lost. He turned to Perrin. I'm fairly confident Thorne may be looking soon for me as well. On my bunk after dinner were transfer notice papers, and I never bothered to open them. Perrin gripped Shem's shoulder. Transfer to Salem? Excellent idea. He pulled Shem into a quick hug. Mari grinned. Pato glared. Jothan patted Shem's back. Your father is going to be one happy man. Now don't disappoint him and fail to show up, he warned as he mounted the other draft horse. Deck saw his time was up and he kissed Jaitsey. I'll be right behind you, I promise, he said, squeezing her hand. I know you will be, Jaitsey said. Deck released her as the horses were kicked into a walk. Her body lurched, then rocked gently as her waving form was carried away into the dark woods. Perrin clapped a comforting hand on his son-in-law's shoulder, and Mari tearfully returned her daughter's wave. How do they know where to go? she whispered. Don't the trees get in the way? The rings on the saddles pivot, Shem explained, and we cut irregular paths for cover. And notice that their bridles make no noise? We pad everything with black lamb's wool. She'll be all right, mother, Pato said worriedly, and glanced over at Shem. Safer than us, I think. Shem folded his arms. Pato, you all right? Oh, I'm just fine, he said sardonically. No problems. You are safe now, Shem told him. If I wasn't confident all of you will reach Salem, I wouldn't be doing this tonight. Oh, really? Pato said with so much animosity that his parents stared at him. Shem took a deep breath. I get it. You don't trust me yet. You haven't given me much reason to. Perrin raised his eyebrows, and Mari exclaimed, Pato! Shem held up his hand, but kept his eyes on Pato. No, Mari, it's all right. 
Dorman felt the same way the night we moved him. I had killed his brother, son of Oren, after all. But Dorman and I reached an understanding, and we've been good friends ever since. And, Mari, he turned to her. That boy Woodson, who's playing Pedo and was so eager to kill your family? He was born in this forest, part of that same group as Dorman. All of that happened on the same night you decided to march into here and find out what was going on. Oh dear, she chuckled apologetically. That was a messy night, wasn't it? At first, Mrs. Young thought you were Dorman, Shem explained. But everyone got sorted out in the end. And the group of 13 that entered the forest was 14 with newborn Woodson. I can't make any guarantees tonight, Shem continued, catching Pato's skeptical gaze. And I don't have time to win your trust right now. We've tried to prepare for every possible outcome, which means we're going to miss something. But all of us want your family to reach Salem safely, because you're so important to us. And why is that? Perrin asked. Pato raised a questioning eyebrow. Because every person is important, Perrin. Mari was about to point out that line sounded a little too pat, but suddenly Shem held up his hand. Perrin nodded. There were more horses, their bridles jangling as they trotted along the edge of the forest. The soldiers usually only walked their horses, but tonight they were in a hurry. Shem twitched a complicated signal to Perrin, who immediately pushed Mari to him. Mari barely caught the unfamiliar signal Perrin winked back to Shem, and Shem grasped her hand tightly while Perrin took her other hand. Perrin then reached back and took Pato's hand, nodding to Deck to hold on to Pato. You're just going to have to trust me. Whatever you do, Shem whispered to them, do not let go of anyone. But Pato protested before being dragged into the forest. Shem darted off to the northwest, pulling everyone behind him. Mari struggled to keep up with his pace, stumbling over fallen tree branches and tripping over the occasional rock. Shem kept a firm hold on her hand as he led them through the forest, and she clung onto Perrin's hand behind her. Occasionally, she glanced back to her son and son-in-law, holding tight to their chain of people. They weaved in and out of trees, behind bushes, around rocks, and between more trees, until Mari was sure even the foliage was confused. They rushed behind a loud steam vent, then dashed around a foul-smelling spring. Shem moved so quickly that before Mari realized they should be alarmed by what they had just passed, they encountered another bizarre and violent manifestation of nature. It must have been the fastest tour of the forest in history. In any other circumstance, she would have been exhausted by the pace and the late hour. But every inch of her was filled with so much anxiety, it propelled her onward. Over there! Someone over there! Raiden gripped the reins of his horse and shouted to the ten following him. Movement behind the grist mill! After them! His soldiers raced ahead of Raiden as his mount impatiently stopped the grounds of the marketplace. Second in commands don't put themselves in danger. That's what enlisted men are for. Behind Raiden, five more soldiers went shouting, and there, oh, slag, there they were, garters, all in black, shouting and whooping like irate owls. Raiden wasn't sure who was chasing who. More soldiers, more men in black, all yelling and running. We found her, one of his ten called, rushing back. Mrs. Brighter! Raiden kicked his horse and rounded the mill. At the commotion of soldiers, he slid off his mount and strode over to them. With so many soldiers, surely those clusters of garters wouldn't stop here. Raiden spied the orange dress right off in the sea of blue uniforms, the wear of it hiding her face and trembling. Well, Raiden thought, at least Thorn will have Jaitsi Shin. Obviously, he wanted the baby as his son, but how long did he expect to keep Jaitsi? Mr. Brighter, Raiden said to the nervous husband, held by two soldiers, why have you brought your wife into such a dangerous situation? One might argue you don't deserve such a woman. 
He gingerly took Jaitsey's arm and, Well, hello, handsome, Jaitsey Brider said in the most grotesque and gravelly voice Raiden had ever heard. He yelped and released the creature's arm, and the face, that craggy face with a bulbous nose and a scruffy beard, a beard, laughed at Raiden's expression. So I guess that is an inappropriate line. Little message here from the garters, said the man, and yes, it was a man, and he was hideous. We're back and out for revenge. And by my calculations, he sized up the crowd of uniforms, this won't take much effort at all. Boys? And just that quickly, Raiden and his men were surrounded by two dozen more men in black, or maybe a hundred. And what happened next, Raiden wasn't quite sure, except that he ended up flat on his back, someone's fist having placed itself well on his nose, and there was shouting and laughter, and by the time he was able to shake the fog from his brain and struggle to his knees, all of his soldiers were also slowly getting up from the ground, dazed and bloodied, from the fastest, most lopsided fistfight Edge had ever seen. The fact that none of them were killed seemed little consolation, and Raiden, as he warily climbed back onto his horse, wondered what happened to Mrs. Brighter that such a repulsive man now had her clothes and was running away with Mr. Brighter. About ten minutes later, Raiden and his men stumbled to the southwest gates of the fort. Raiden wanted nothing more than to collapse on a cot in the surgery to let his nose stop bleeding. But when he saw Afra, mounted with his ten and blocking the gate, he knew that wasn't about to happen. Thorn wants you at the forest's edge five minutes ago. But we've been punched by garters, Raiden exclaimed, ignoring how lame that sounded. My soldiers need attending to. Thorn thinks he found Shin, that they went into the forest. Raiden's shoulders drooped. So he's gone then? Afra shook his head. Thorn wants us to pursue him. If we're not there in the next few minutes, he'll demote us. To what? Raiden cried, prodding his horse back to the road. This is madness! Afra sighed in agreement, and Raiden realized it was the first thing they had agreed on in weeks. Apparently Shin headed into the forests on a couple of occasions, Afra told him, and Thorn's eager to prove he's as capable, or as stupid. So, Raiden said with a hint of triumph, as their twenty men reluctantly followed them, your little hero worship of Perrin Shin is finally coming to an end? Of course not, Afra said, scanning the darkness before him. I hope he escapes. But where will he escape to? Raiden scoffed at that. <laughs> There's no escape. He'll come running out of that forest terrified. Where's Zenus, anyway? In the forest. So it's confirmed? Raiden released a low whistle. What the slack does he think he's doing? I don't know, Afra said. I wish I did. But Thorne said something odd when he got the news. He said, slagging Zenus really was one of them. Raiden scowled. One of them? What's that supposed to mean? I was hoping you'd know, Afra grumbled. Realize this, Raiden. Thorne's been keeping things from us, from you. When all of this shakes down and when Geneva arrives, we'll have to explain what happened. Some of this will shake down on us unless we can prove that Thorn didn't tell us all he knew. Our only hope it was to retaining our commissions is to drop it all on Thorn, whose leadership, or lack thereof, has led to six more soldiers deserting just this evening and contributed directly to the loss of the Shins and the Briders. Oh, no, no, I know where the Brighters are, at least Mr. Brighter. He's running away with the ugliest cross-dresser I've ever met. Who knew, right? Proves you just can't always tell with some man. Afra stared at him. Had you ever met Mr. Brighter? I recognized his clothes from the descriptions. Decoys, Raiden. They were decoys. Raiden considered the possibility. Oh. Which leaves a more disturbing question of, where are the real brighters? 
But don't tell Thorin about that just yet. Look, Afra whispered, seeing that Thorin and his tent were less than a hundred paces away. I don't like you, and you don't like me, but I hate Thorin even more. He'll drag us down with him unless we claw our way out of this together. Thorn's not going to be in any position to do you any favors after tonight. Understand? I think so. But if both of us come out of this looking better than him, either one or both of us may get promoted and get out of here. Raiden blinked. When did you become so scheming? The last three weeks have been the longest of my life, said Afra. Considering some of the weeks I've had, that's saying a lot. They were now at the edge of the forest, where Thorn was glaring at Raiden. What happened to you? Raiden rubbed at his nose again, inadvertently spreading some of the still leaking blood around. Ambushed, sir, by garters, said they're back and wanting revenge. Thorn's shoulder twitched. Any sign of the brighters? Some, Raiden said, inventing wildly. They were running back in the direction of the house, which was somewhat true. Good, said Thorn. The shins are in there. He cocked his head to the trees behind him. I'm sure of it, although I have 60 men conducting a house-to-house -house search as we speak. Men, tonight we're going to conquer that forest, retrieve the shins, and become legends in our own time. Afra's fake cough sounded like, right. Thorn sent him a warning glare before he turned to Raiden. Because I have the most confidence in you, Raiden. Afra let his gaze wander up to the stars, peeking through patches of clouds. You will take the pack horse, carrying the incarceration chains with your group. Thorn gestured to a horse that jangled noisily. My group will flush the shins over to you, and we'll box them in. Chain up each shin until Genev can retrieve them. Afra, Thorn turned to him, and Afra was purposely slow about meeting his eyes. Don't think you're getting out of any of this. Your reluctance is being documented in your permanent file every day. Thank you, Afra said. I will need that kind of evidence. You're so useless, Afra. Another note I'll add to your file. Take your ten and enter the forest 200 paces to the west. Your group will make sure the shins don't escape. We don't want these garters snatching them away from us. Remarkable coincidence that they chose tonight to stage their return. Because of Zenus? interrupted Afra, and every man of the thirty stared at him. Tell them what you said earlier, Thorn, Afra challenged. You said Zenus really is one of them. Why didn't you let any of us know there was a traitor among us? Now thirty eyes swiveled in alarm back to their commander. Thorn sat taller. You misheard, Afra. Had I known Zenas was a spy, you really think I wouldn't have done something about it? I really don't know what to think tonight, Thorn. Let's just get this latest bad plan of yours over with. Shem led them over a hill that felt alarmingly hot under their boots, and down a ridge into a gully where caves on either side groaned and coughed out hot water. Mari felt splashes on her face as they weaved between them, and she used her shoulder to brush the water off her cheeks. In some areas, the ground sounded inexplicably hollow, and often she smelled sulfur yet couldn't discern its source. She was grateful she held the hands of two strong men. They diminished her terror and filled her with borrowed bravery. After many more frenetic minutes of winding through brush and trees, Mari heard soft snorting again. She stopped, but Shem continued to pull her along, with Perrin pushing from behind. But Shem, I heard the horses we've hidden for you. They emerged in a small clearing where five horses stood tethered to trees. Mari would have sighed in relief if she wasn't panting so hard to catch her breath. Perrin did sigh, however, but Pato's and Dex's eyes were wide and terrified. Shem noticed their expressions. I'm sure you'll be happy to hear that this is the end of your walking on this journey. If you want to call what we just did walking, Pato said, 
I'd call it dragging, running, yanking, pulling, stumbling. Perrin elbowed him before putting an arm around Mari. Are you all right? Yes, but a little shaky, she confessed. I imagine it's not as scary in the daytime, right, Shem? Actually, it's worse when you can see the bottomless caverns you run between. Many people freeze up and can't take another step. Mari was sure her heart stopped beating for a moment. We ran between bottomless caverns? The traumatized and now slightly amused looks on her son and son-in-law told her they had. On that steaming hillside, Shem said, we've tossed rocks in them and never heard them land. To Perrin, he murmured theatrically, I see now how she walked right past Jothan last night without seeing him. But, Mari, the worst of the forest is now behind you. I'm not so sure about that, Perrin said. He gently pivoted Mari to face a horse. She stared at it for a moment, glanced at her husband, then back at the animal, which grew taller each moment. Breeches, Perrin reminded her, taking a pinch of the cloth covering her hip. Not just the latest Salemite fashion. Before she knew what was happening, Perrin picked her up and hefted her onto the horse. Oh, I don't know about this. She fumbled for the reins. Now, Shem, where do we go from here? Perrin asked. Shem tilted his head. Don't you want to see your mount first? What do you mean? Perrin peered into the darkness of the other large forms. Right over there. Perrin squinted, then gasped. Clark! Shem chuckled. He's your horse, Perrin, not the fort's. I was there when Gary Yordan gave him to you. John Offra has been taking care of him, but I think he's been pining for you. Clark was already pulling at his reins secured to a tree. Perrin jogged over and loosed him. I thought I'd never see you again. He pressed his forehead against Clark's and rubbed his neck vigorously. As disturbed as she was to be sitting on a horse, Mari was even more dismayed at the affection between man and horse. No wonder Perrin often came home smelling like horse sweat. Your disappearance may have been what set the fort looking for us, Perrin said to Clark, who snuffed happily, or so Mari assumed. She wrinkled her nose and worried about horse snot on her husband's face, the face she frequently kissed, or used to. Nope. Shem told him. I took him out this morning telling the stable hands that I was sending him back to Jordan. Instead, I snuck him over to Dorman waiting at the tree line, who tethered him up here. We can always use new breeding stock in Salem. Clark will be one happy stud there. Perrin chuckled as his large black horse nuzzled him. Shem, thank you. Well, at least someone's happy with his mode of travel, Mari murmured. Shem climbed atop his horse and saluted Mari with a grin. She returned a grimace. Straight north, Shem said. If I should lose you, you keep north. Pato, eyeing the horse closest to him, whispered to Deck, Straight north. How can we tell which way's north? Just go uphill, Shem told him. Now get on your horse, Pato, before your father decides to help you. Pato shrugged and took two tries to get himself up, after surreptitiously watching to see how Deck mounted. For some reason, Perrin picked up a stick before mounting Clark. Mari eyed her horse. Shem, this is a nice animal, right? Doesn't move strangely? Mari, just hold on tight. She was about to ask for suggestions how, when a distinct horse whinny in the distance caught their attention. That's not one of ours, Shem whispered. In a low voice, Perrin ordered, Deck, head straight up the slope. Mari and Perrin, stay close behind. Shem and I will bring up the rear. Deck nodded and kicked his horse. Pato shot a doubtful glance at his father before he reluctantly kicked his horse to follow Deck. Mari couldn't look more pitifully at her husband, she was sure. But he just raised the stick and jabbed the horse's rump. 
Mari's horse took off in a fast gallop into the trees. West. North! Shem frantically whispered as her horse disappeared. I said north! He's up on the reins! Perrin whispered loudly, although he knew it was hopeless. Deck's horse cut hard to the west to catch Mari's, and Pato followed, vanishing into the night. No, 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 Perrin whispered. He glared at Shem. Yes, I said it three times. Shem gripped his arm. She'll be all right. That horse always knows where to find a meal. And I left one up at the next clearing about a quarter of a mile up. Now, it might take him a while to get there, seeing as how they're taking a circuitous route. The sound of approaching horses shut them up. They shared a series of complex facial tics, then crept down the hillside onto a rock outcropping for a better look, leaving Clark and Shem's horse above them. Eleven soldiers were slowly picking their way through the trees, their bodies twitching nervously in the unfamiliar terrain. In the lead was a tense soldier in a captain's jacket. Perrin and Shem stared at each other in amazement. Lemuel Thorne was in the forest. And that's the end of the chapter. Thank you.